Uh, this morning, it uh, gives us pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Seneschal, who's going to be presenting a uh, topic on hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. Uh, Dr. Seneschal sadly went to Duke, the only number two seed to lose so far. Georgetown. Georgetown? Oh, okay. Uh, excuse me. Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, who would ever bring something up like that? Uh, and then uh, went to medical school at... <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> uh, went to medical school uh, at the, use, I always say useless, but what, Uniform, Services. Uniform Services Medical School, and obviously is completing her residency here with us. And it's a pleasure to have you here this morning. Let's see, I don't know how to make it. This looks different than mine. How do I make it a... Uh... Thank you. I must have the old version. Um, <clears throat> so this morning I'm going to talk about the treatment specifically of hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, I'll talk a little bit initially about the epidemiology and the risk factors and uh, the patient workup and staging, um, but then we're going to dive right into the treatment. Um, we'll talk first about palliative options, including chemotherapy and chemoembolization followed by curative treatments, ab ablative therapies, resection, and transplant. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about combining these therapies to provide additional treatment and therapies that can be used as a bridge to transplant. So we'll talk first a little bit about the epidemiology. Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is the fifth most common tumor worldwide. It's actually the number one cause of deaths from cancer in parts of Asia and the Middle East. Um, the male-to-female ratio, as you see there, uh, slightly higher in the male group. Um, and despite all this talk about the rest of the world, the incidence in the U.S. and Europe is also rising. This is a fairly old uh, chart. I think it's from 1988, but it shows uh, w the worldwide annual incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma is about a million. So it's new cases of HCC every year. It's a million people. Um, in the U.S., that's a fairly small percentage, only 9,000. Um, the numbers, uh, the more recent numbers I've seen are actually a little bit lower than this, probably more like 600,000 and 6,000 in the U.S., but as you, can, as you can see, the U.S. is still a very small percentage of that. The incidence, as I mentioned, of HCC in the U.S. has been increasing. It's up 114% between 1975 and 1998. Um, the hepatitis C epidemic in the U.S. started in about the 1960s and peaked in the 1980s and has uh, been trending down since then. However, because uh, HCC related to hepatitis C tends to be about 20 years out from the diagnosis or from the um, initial uh, disease acquiring, um, the incidence of HCC in the U.S. will continue to rise over the next 10 to 20 years. Of note, only 30 percent of patients that are candidates for potential, only 30 percent of patients with HCC are candidates for potentially curative treatment, um, i.e. resection or transplantation, um, which this just highlights the importance of surveillance of cirrhotics to catch their tumors early and the importance of coming up with valuable or uh, with um, palliative therapy options that actually work. Um, so this here is a map showing actually the hepatitis B prevalence throughout the world. Um, you can see fairly uncommon in the U.S., but significantly higher across parts of Asia, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and then some of the more remote locations in North and South America. Um, it's also, if you'll note, very similar to the next map, which shows the incidence of primary liver cancer throughout the world. Again, very high in the uh, Eastern Asia and Southeast Asia, and then some parts of, of Africa. Um, if you map out the mortality from primary liver cancer, it looks almost exactly the same as this map. So now we'll talk a little bit about the risk factors for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, cirrhosis from any cause is the number one risk factor. However, 30% uh, of patients that have hepatitis B that do not have cirrhosis do develop HCC, so it is possible to have HCC without having cirrhosis. Um, in the U.S., the most common cause is hepatitis C, um, with alcoholic cirrhosis a close second. And approximately 1 to 8 of, to eight percent of patients with the disorders listed there um, will develop HCC as well. And that includes um, autoimmune hepatitis and fatty liver, uh, which are probably the ones we see more commonly around here. So if you map out patients, if you take at year zero, you have 1,000 patients with cirrhosis, none with hepatocellular carcinoma, and no deaths. If you get to year two and map out those same patients, you get 35 with HCC, but still significantly more of them that have died. 
If you go up to years 10 and 20, the actual number of people with HCC has stayed steady or decreased, but the deaths from your liver disease have increased. Um, so what this highlights is that most of the patients actually die from cirrhosis itself, not from hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, but this component of HCC is important um, because it makes treating it a challenge. Um, a definitive treatment is oftentimes not possible because of the extent of the patient's non-malignant liver disease. So going a little bit into staging and prognostic factors. <coughs> Um, prognosis is dictated by both the extent of the cancer, which is both size and the proximity to the vital structures, as well as the patient's residual liver function. So you really can't use exclusively TNM staging or child Pew scores alone. Um, you have to combine the liver function and the extent of the tumor to come up with a staging and a prognosis. The ACUDA staging system was the one that was originally used, had been used for about 20 years. Um, it took into account both the tumor volume itself as well as the presence of ascites, bilirubin, and albumin. Um, with the advent of better imaging over the last 10 years or so um, with CT scans and MRIs, the ACUDA staging system has kind of gone by the wayside. Um, today there's numerous different staging models that people use. Um, I'd say there were probably 10 to 12 in the literature that I read. Um, I'm not going to go over any of them. Um, for the most part, surgeons don't use them terribly often. Um, they're mostly used by hepatologists for prognosis. What we do use commonly as surgeons is what's called the Milan criteria. Um, it's used almost exclusively for listing for transplant. Uh, and it's a single lesion less than or equal to five centimeters, or up to three lesions, each less than or equal to three centimeters. And if the patient meets those criteria, that's what's currently considered to be acceptable for listing a patient with HCC for transplant. So this slide here highlights the importance of screening patients with cirrhosis for hepatocellular carcinoma. So if you take a patient with cirrhosis and you screen them, 10% of them are going to have cancer. Of those, 90% are going to be treatable with an, average tenure, with an average survival of 10 years. If you don't screen them, the 10% that at that time and at that point in time, the 10% of those that have cancer, by the time that they are symptomatic, only 50% are going to be treatable. 50% are not going to be treatable with an average survival of a year. So this highlights the importance of why we should screen patients with cirrhosis for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, the patient workup done by hepatologists mostly. Um, AFP is the most widely used screening tool. It's fairly cheap. It can be done um, in an, other countries that don't have as advanced uh, imaging as we do. Um, the sensitivity and specificity vary widely, and it really depends on the cutoff you use. Um, as you decrease the cutoff, the sensitivity obviously rises. You pick up more patients that might have the disease, but the specificity falls, and you end up getting more unnecessary tests and biopsies. Obviously, the vice versa is true if you raise the cutoff. You're going to miss patients that might have the disease. So typically, an AFP greater than 20 triggers further testing, further imaging. Um, usually, that's done by ultrasound. That's the initial screening uh, test. An ultrasound nodule less than a centimeter just warrants a repeat ultrasound in six months. One to two centimeters, CT and MRI tend to not be terribly accurate at distinguishing what type of lesion this is. Um, so oftentimes you'll go directly to biopsy for that. If it's greater than two centimeters, you can use CT and MRI to better characterize it and try to avoid a biopsy if it ends up being something uh, other than an HCC. <coughs> so to discuss a little more details of uh, patient imaging, high resolution ultrasound, as I mentioned, can document uh, even sub-centimeter lesions. It's usually used as the first screening tool. It's cheap, essentially no uh, adverse side effects for the patient. CT and MRI, as they've gotten better over the years, have become more commonplace. Um, they use multi-phase contrast imaging, of which the arterial phase is the most important. And then there's another imaging test called CT arterial portography, which I've actually never seen done, but is talked about in the literature. And we'll talk a little more about how that works in a minute. Show it very well. So here's a standard CT scan. This area here is obviously an abnormality. Um, it looks a lot like it could be an FNH. Uh, it's got a central scar. But in a patient with hepatitis C and a mildly elevated AFP, a biopsy was done, and this was found to be an HCC. Now to talk about our, uh, arterial portography. The 
HCCs are supplied almost exclusively by the hepatic artery, um, whereas the remainder of the liver is supplied mostly by the portal vein. Um, so what you can do is an injection into the SMA, which then flows through the bowel into the SMV and into the portal vein, and then you shoot the, the CAT scan as the dye goes through the portal system. Um, areas that are uh, fed primarily by the hepatic artery show up as lucencies. So you can see this tumor that we looked at on the last slide, but you also see an additional one here that was not imaged on the original CAT scan. So this can be a useful imaging test um, in a patient that you're trying to figure out what type of treatment to provide. All right, so now we're going to talk about treatment specifically. <coughs> So there's a lot of different, this is sort of a Venn diagram of different treatment options. Curative treatments, as you can see in the circle at the top, um, transplant, resection, and radiofrequency ablation. Um, some of those overlap into the uh, bridging circle down here on the bottom, which can be used to bridge patients to transplant. And then palliative treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, uh, chemoembolization, and then RFA actually falls into all three categories. We'll talk about all these options. So we'll talk first about chemotherapy. Traditionally, chemotherapy for hepatocellular carcinoma has very limited utility. Response rates are about 25%, no real survival benefit, and it's essentially been used only for advanced disease and in clinical trials. However, that being said, um, there's been some studies out there. Um, Sirolimus or rapamune, as we more commonly call it, is an immunosuppressant that's used for transplant. And there are some studies that report that it has anti-tumor activity. Um, a study done by Neatman et al., um, they studied a specifically rapamune-based transplant immunosuppression protocol. They tried to minimize the use of steroids and calcineurin inhibitors, and then they evaluated how this affected their patients with HCC. Um, it did result in delayed tumor recurrence, 22 months versus 8 months, and higher, a higher survival rate after recurrence. Uh, 23 versus 10 months. The bottom line, however, for, for using this is that it needs further study. Um, we've, it needs a direct comparison trial between different immunosuppression protocols, um, which Neatman's clearly was not. Um, so it's hard, this is still in sort of the early phase as, as being a uh, possible treatment option. Another option, that, another drug that was just approved by the FDA for use with hepatocellular carcinoma is called Nexavar. Um, it was originally used to treat renal cell carcinoma, uh, and it recently underwent a double-blinded multicenter trial uh, compared with placebo and showed increased overall survival by 44 percent, where median survival was 10.7 months versus 7.9 months. And you can see the numbers in the study weren't huge. Um, the next of our arm was 299 patients, the placebo arm was 300. But even at 6, 8, 10 months out, there was a significant difference between the two arms of the study. Nexavar works by uh, blocking multiple tyrosine kinase uh, sites. Uh, it blocks vascular endothelial growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, several other growth factors as well. Um, the most common side effect of this is skin toxicities, numbness, erythema, swelling. It's most commonly in the hands and feet. Um, you can have significant desquamation and ulceration, which does require stopping the drug. Now we'll talk about transarterial chemoembolization. This is typically used for tumors that are too large or multicentric for curative resection. Um, the goal is to interrupt the blood supply to the tumor while limiting damage to the rest of the liver. Um, again, the reason this works is because greater than 90 percent of the blood supply to the hepatocellular carcinoma comes from the hepatic artery, um, and 80 percent of the normal liver blood supply comes from the portal vein. So you can see here, this is a CAT scan showing a large hepatocellular carcinoma on the, in the right lobe. And here's an art, uh, arteriogram of the same area showing increased uptake in the area where the tumor is with minimal uptake in the remainder of the liver. So chemoembolization, um, the hepatic artery is, is uh, catheterized and chemotherapy is uh, injected into that artery. It ends up being concentrated 10 to 100 times in the area of the tumor. Um, the embolization of that artery also induces tumor necrosis. It helps block further blood flow, which would wash out the chemotherapy. Um, drugs used include cisplatin, doxorubicin, and mitomycin C. 
<clears throat> There's no difference in trials so far as to which chemotherapeutic agent works better or which dose is best. Um, so that's definitely some, an area that needs more study. Um, side effects of chemobilization include fever and abdominal pain, most of which are self-limited, vomiting, elevated LFTs. However, the progression to liver failure can be as high as 60% in patients with child C cirrhosis. Um, and this would require uh, a transplant or would obviously kill the patient, so this is important to uh, note. Um, and if damage to the liver is too much, even if it doesn't kill the patient, their survival can actually be shortened, and it's not from tumor recurrence, but can actually be from worsening liver failure. So this is a significant side effect of chemobilization. So does this work? Um, small tumors uh, have about 95% necrosis. However, larger tumors result in only about 44% necrosis, and this is done on, this was determined on autopsy studies. Um, independent predictors of mortality, reasons that patients do worse with this therapy, uh, is if the tumor has invaded the portal vein, if they have constitutional symptoms uh, pre-treatment, including weight loss and anorexia, if they have portal vein thrombosis, and again, if they have an elevated child's pew score. Um, a meta-analysis of several small studies showed a trend toward improved one-year survival with chemoembolization. Um, however, the trend was not statistically significant. This was thought to be due to the limitations of the studies themselves as opposed to the actual treatment. But again, further studies are clearly needed on this topic. So now ablative therapies. Um, these are actually considered a curative treatment. Um, this is the best option for early hepatocellular carcinoma that is not amenable to resection or transplantation for whatever reason. The average five-year survival is about 40 to 50 percent. There's multiple options for ablative therapies. There's uh, chemical ablation, most commonly done with ethanol, but can also be done with acetic acid or hot saline. And then thermal ablation, the most common of which is radiofrequency ablation, um, and then also microwave and laser ablation. So chemical ablation, as I mentioned, percutaneous ethanol injection, or PEI, is probably the most common uh, type of this. It's performed under ultrasound guidance and local anesthesia and results in complete ablation of 70% of tumors smaller than 3 centimeters. You can see the three-year survival rates listed here in child's A and B patients. Uh, comparing surgery to PEI, uh, their survival rates are actually very similar uh, and significantly improved compared to those patients that, that received no treatment. So this does work fairly well. Side effects of PEI include tumor seeding of the needle tract. Um, this is fairly common, and there's no way really to prevent it. Um, the other problem with PEI is that the, while the survival rate may be similar to surgery, the local recurrence rate is very high. Um, <clears throat> and this usually does require additional treatments down the road. The other two options I mentioned before, acetic acid and hot saline injections, um, have varied results in the studies. They compared favorably in one study, but not in a follow-up study, and they've not essentially been tested in any large series. The average reported survival for use of these two uh, essentially is no better than PEI, um, and they're not commonly used. Thermal ablation. Um, RFA is the most common, probably the only one that most of us have heard of uh, prior to today. Um, it creates a thermal injury to the tissue via an electrical current. It's done with ultrasound or CT guidance and requires conscious sedation or general anesthetic. So it's a little bit more involved of a process than uh, PEI. Um, one of advantage of RFA is that you can ablate the needle tract on your way in and out of the patient. Um, <clears throat> however, the rate of tumor seeding is actually similar to PEI, so this is um, maybe not necessarily an advantage. Side effects include hemorrhage, thermal damage to the intestines, tumor seeding, as I talked about, and cholecystitis. Um, cholecystitis is significantly higher in patients whose tumors are near the gallbladder. Um, it doesn't make it not an option um, for tumors in that location, but you should be aware and the patient should be aware too that this is a risk. So it's just an image of a, a fake patient getting an RFA. You can see it's ultrasound guided. Um, this is the image that they're looking at on the ultrasound, and then just a needle with a catheter. Here's some examples of some RFA catheters. Um, <clears throat> long ago, they used to use just a single straight catheter, uh, but obviously the area that they could ablate with that small of a catheter was pretty minimal, so they branched out into these um, sort of tree and flower looking catheters that provide a wider spread of ablation. <coughs> Sorry. 
Um, so this is an area, or this, this is a CAT scan documenting RFA and what it looks like pre and post. So this is before the treatment. This is just the tumor itself. One day post-op. <coughs> One day post-op, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for this hypervascular area around the tumor. And even three months out, you can see that this defect is still present. Ah. You can see that this defect is still present and still larger than the original tumor. It's important. Okay, I'm going to stop touching that button. It's important uh, for referring doctors and primary care managers and things of that nature to know that if RFA has been done, that this is a normal appearance. This does not mean that the tumor's back or has gotten larger. So, so how can you tell that the tumor's back? It's a good question. Check their AFP. Yeah. Okay. So what are the results of RFA? Um, survival rates are similar to PEI. Um, <clears throat> however, the two-year recurrence-free survival is significantly improved from PEI, 64% versus 43%. Um, and infinite risk factors for mortality with RFA include underlying cirrhosis and just multiplicity of tumors. Other types of thermal ablation, as I mentioned, microwave ablation uh, has results similar to PEI. Um, and when you compare RFA with microwave ablation, uh, it, they essentially have the complication rate and the rate of residual tumor are the same, um, but you do typically require fewer treatments with RFA. And no study really has looked at survival and recurrence data between RFA and microwave ablation. Laser ablation um, has survival rates that seem similar to PEI and RFA. Um, <clears throat> but it's essentially unstudied for hepatocellular carcinoma. There are some studies with laser ablation for metastases to the liver, um, but as there used to be with RFA, there's some limitation with the size of the probe used for laser ablation. Uh, they can't get a big rim on it or a big uh, diameter of, of area. Um, <clears throat> so at the moment, laser ablation is not the most practical method. It's not something that's typically used. So now we'll start talking about resection and other surgical options. Partial hepatectomy um, remains the standard curative treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma in non serotics um, The tumor disseminates via the portal venous branches, so an anatomic resection is considered the gold standard as opposed to just a wedge resection. Five-year survival is about 70 to 80 percent, and this is a number for the ideal patient for resection, small tumor burden, preserved hepatic function. Uh, the survival rate is much lower for patients that don't meet those criteria. And the tumor recurrence rate can be high depending on the resection and the margins that you use. It's just a brief um, map of the anatomic liver segments, uh, it's more for the junior residents. Um, <coughs> segments uh, one is the caudate lobe, two and three are considered the left lateral segment of the liver. Um, four is still the left lobe of the liver um, because it's to the left of the gallbladder, but it is to the right of the thalsiform. And then uh, segments four through, or I'm sorry, five through eight make up the right lobe of the liver. Um, she et al. In, uh, in 2006 studied resection margins for, H for HCC. Um, they doc their patient inclusion criteria was a single lesion. Uh, so obviously this study is not as relevant or is more difficult to apply to patients that have more than one lesion. But they did stratify patients into groups based on their tumor size. And they noticed a statistically significant survival difference for patients that underwent resection for HCC that had one centimeter versus two centimeter margins. This difference was most pronounced with patients that had small tumors, so less than or equal to two centimeters. Um, it, essentially, a two centimeter margin with a tumor that size resulted in a 100% five year survival. Show up at all? So you can see that <coughs> pretty uh, significant difference even at less than two years out between both in cumulative survival and recurrence-free survival <coughs> with the two centimeter resection versus the one centimeter resection. So clearly if you're operating on HCC, a large margin of resection is, is uh, appropriate. There is some data in the literature on minimally invasive liver resections. Um, these are mostly one or two segment resections, but there were a handful of lobectomies that were done this way in the study. Um, they were done either laparoscopically or lap hand assisted. 
Um, they did result in a shorter hospital stay, two versus five days. Blood loss and transfusion requirements were less. The conversion rate to open was about six and a half percent. I'm not sure you can convince a lot of people doing liver sections that laparoscopic is the way to go, but it is documented out there. <laughs> so results of liver resection. Um, this five-year survival rates for stages one and two are fairly high, 78 and 64 percent. This drops off pretty significantly with stage three cancers and stage four. Um, the disease-free survival rates are also quite a bit lower than the actual uh, disease or than the actual survival rates, um, indicating that these patients may need to have um, palliative or other treatments somewhere in this time frame. Um, the operative mortality was significantly higher for stages three and four. Obviously, you're doing a bigger liver resection. Um, and adverse prognostic factors for this, portal vein and major hepatic vein invasion. So how about the use of chemoembolization and resection combined? Um, several studies have been done on this topic. Most were done fairly poorly um, with significant patient dropout that affected the results. Um, but there are a couple of clear take-home messages about the topic. Um, there is worse survival if surgery is delayed to receive chemoembolization. So you want to make sure that you're not delaying their surgery in order to try to downsize their tumor. Um, three series did suggest a survival benefit if the tumor was fairly large. Um, 10% of tumors were downstaged to a resectable size, which is advantageous. But overall, there's no real convincing evidence for preoperative chemoembolization. Um, if you can resect someone, that's probably just the way you should go. So moving on now to talk about transplant itself. This is the most definitive treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma. You achieve the widest resection margins. Um, you remove the additional cirrhotic liver thereby reducing the chance for transformation into a new hepatocellular carcinoma. The problem with transplant as a treatment is that only 10 to 20 percent of patients in the U.S. are candidates for this form of treatment, and worldwide only 5 percent of patients, so you're missing a significant portion of the patients. The major concern about transplant is the waiting list dropout rates uh, tend to be as high as 20 percent or more after six months. And we'll talk a little bit more later about bridging patients to transplant with other treatments. Um, <clears throat> In the U.S., we use the model for end-stage liver disease, or the MELD score, um, to uh, rank people for who gets the transplant soonest. Uh, it includes bilirubin, prothrombin time, and creatinine. And they relatively recently introduced an extra number, variable number of points for hepatocellular carcinoma. So you often find yourself transplanting someone that, whose cirrhosis is not that bad, but because of they, their HCC, they actually have a higher MELD score than someone else. This was this was designed to prevent dropout off the waiting list and to better treat HCC with transplant. So we talked a little bit earlier about the Milan criteria. Those were uh, initiated in 1996. Uh, again, the, just to go over them, it's a single lesion less than or equal to 5 centimeters or 2 to 3 lesions less than or equal to 3 centimeters each. Um, the Milan criteria are used to determine fitness for transplant, meaning the good prognosis is likely. Um, when these were initiated in 96, the tumor recurrence rate dropped from 40 percent to 6.3 percent, and this five-year survival increased from 42 to 83 percent. Um, the recurrence at, when they were first initiated was 3.1 times higher if the patient was outside the Milan criteria. There is, however, significant debate and several studies ongoing about expanding the Milan criteria to include more patients. One of these was done uh, by Duffy. Uh, they evaluated whether expanding the Milan criteria to the UCSF criteria uh, yielded acceptable survival rates. In the UCSF criteria, uh, one tumor less than or equal to six and a half centimeters, and two to, or two to three, none greater than four and a half. Uh, they said that their survival rates were not statistically significant, 79% um, for Milan criteria and 64% for UCSF criteria. Um, they did note that patients that were beyond the UCSF criteria did have significantly decreased survival. There was another study done by Loong et al. that documented also that they believe UCSF criteria was a better cutoff for transplant. They had numbers very similar to the Duffy study. Um, and both studies found that uh, beyond UCSF criteria, your outcomes were significantly worse. One major problem that wasn't discussed in any of these studies is that if you expand the criteria for transplant, the number of people on the waiting list goes up, and the risk for patient dropout due to progression of tumor is going to be higher, obviously, as well. Um, and like I said, this fact really hasn't been addressed by any of these studies um, and is a major, probably the biggest argument to not expanding the transplant criteria. Um, there have been some uh, 
there's more or there's been more use recently of living donors for hepatocellular carcinoma transplants. Um, this is becoming increasingly an option. It does decrease time on the waiting list if you can find a living donor. Um, the biggest concern for most transplant surgeons is the effect on the living donor. Um, morbidity is 19% with the right hepatectomy, which is usually what's done um, for living donor transplant. Um, living donor recipients have a 69% survival at three years, and the HCC recurrence rate is 12.7%. Both of these numbers are not as good as a cadaveric liver transplant for HCC. Um, there's some question that oftentimes living donors are solicited for people that maybe wouldn't meet cr transplant criteria. Um, so maybe they're a little sicker, have greater tumor burden. That may be why their numbers are not as good. Um, just again briefly for the junior residents, the living donor operation uh, is essentially the right lobe of the liver, the right hepatic vein, the right branch of the portal vein and hepatic artery, and the uh, right uh, hepatic bile duct. So what are the results of transplantation? Overall, the three-year survival is very good. <coughs> about 70 to 80 percent. The five-year survival does drop off a little bit to 60 to 70 percent. And five-year survival rates for transplant are lower when patients are transplanted for HCC than those that are transplanted for just hepatitis C. Um, and this is thought to be due to the increased number of recurrences of the cancer, specifically between the three and five-year mark. Um, stage one HCC does significantly better uh, than the other stages as would be expected. Risk factors for poor prognosis and higher recurrence rate, even with transplant, um, patients that are found on explant analysis to have vascular invasion, those with a pre-transplant AFP greater than 300, tumor size greater than 3 centimeters, multifocality of the tumor, and poor differentiation um, histologically. Um, these risk factors were confirmed in several studies, and they were found to be statistically significant every time. So now talking about a little bit about bridging patients to transplant, as I mentioned earlier. Um, waiting list times for transplant can be fairly long, one to two years, and the HCC doubling time is about six months. So unless they're listed with a very small tumor, the chance that they're going to drop out over the course of a couple of years is fairly high. Um, <clears throat> patients will also have dropout from the list uh, based on hepatic failure or infectious issues, which might cause a death. And the goal of the bridging therapies <laughs> is to improve the long-term survival sometimes to downstage to Milan criteria and to prevent waiting list dropout. So chemoembolization, something that's frequently been uh, used and studied as a bridge to transplant. Um, overall, the results with this are worse compared with other therapies that are used to bridge patients. Um, there is of note no increase in hepatic artery complications post-transplant, which uh, if you're embolizing the hepatic artery, uh, was it initially a concern. Um, Decanes et al. did a study of 100 patients who got chemoembolization and 100 that didn't, all 200 of those did get transplanted. They essentially found no significant improvement in waiting list dropout or long-term survival. Radiofrequency ablation is probably what's most commonly used nowadays as a bridge to transplant. Um, the waiting list dropout rate is lower, 5 to 12 percent, compared with the traditional 20 percent at six months due to tumor progression. Um, on post-transplant analysis, 70% of the nodules were found to be completely ablated, and the post-transplant survival data are essentially equivalent to historical controls. Um, the other nice thing about RFA is you have the option to treat multiple tumors and to treat them several times with essentially minimal morbidity um, in order to bridge a patient to transplant. Um, using these uh, other methods to bridge patients or to downstage the tumor to meet Milan criteria is fairly controversial, as you can imagine, um, and the waiting list dropout is much higher in patients that are downstaged, um, which essentially shows that they probably are having, um, their tumor is going to be more aggressive and grow faster. So now the question becomes resection versus transplant. I've said that these options are both good. Um, they both have similar results, at least in terms of five-year survival. So which one is the best option? Tanaka et al. evaluated patients that were qualified for both primary resection and transplant. Um, and he evaluated them based on which arm they fell into. Um, the five-year survival rate with anatomic resection was 78.2 percent, which is similar to a transplant. The recurrence rate with transplant was significantly lower, as you would expect. Um, pa patients that had larger tumors that had vascular invasion 
or that had poorly differentiated tumors, as well as younger patients, um, all did better with primary transplant. So at least from this study, I think you could sort of liken it to the mastectomy versus lumpectomy for breast cancer. So the long-term survival rate's the same, but the recurrence rate is higher with the lumpectomy or resection. Uh, De Carli said all value, they agreed with Tanaka in terms of survival and recurrence data. They found that independent factors for survival with resection were AFP level, um, degree of cirrhosis, and histological grade of the tumor. And Cha et al. also had the similar results with 611 patients who did meet Milan criteria for transplant but underwent resection instead. Um, Adam and his colleagues studied a secondary liver or secondary liver transplant after primary resection. Um, and you can see that across the board, the numbers were significantly worse for patients that underwent a secondary transplant compared with primary liver transplant. Um, operative mortality significantly higher, intraoperative blood transfusion requirements higher, tumor recurrence rate is higher, five-year survival is lower, and disease-free survival is significantly lower. In addition, only 20% of patients who underwent initial primary resection and then came back with recurrence, um, only 20% of those um, were actually even candidates for a secondary liver transplant. So the conclusion from this paper was that resection as a bridge to transplant is not a good option. Um, would the patients that have, that recurred or had worsening liver failure after resection, would they have done poorly anyways, even if they'd not gotten a transplant, or if they'd been transplanted initially, that's certainly possible, um, because they're already dis demonstrating that their disease is going to recur, but we don't have a good answer for that. Um, Belgetti and his colleagues did a very similar study about the same time as Adam uh, with similar number of patients, and they disagreed with his findings. Um, they reported essentially no difference in operative course, ICU or hospital stay, or five-year survivals. Um, so clearly there's a lot of debate out there about which option is best. Uh, after talking to our transplant staff here, it seems that the best option in a patient that is not a cirrhotic is to do a resection if they meet those criteria. They have good liver function <coughs> otherwise. Um, in a patient that is a cirrhotic, um, their risk of um, forming new HCCs and their risk of recurrence is higher. Um, it's better to just list those folks for transplant. So kind of the conclusions from that topic is that resection as a primary treatment has results equal to transplant as a primary treatment. Um, but patients who do poorly after their resection and eventually come to a secondary transplant may do worse. Um, so again, as I mentioned, if you have cirrhosis and an HCC, the answer is probably transplant. If you don't have cirrhosis and you just have an HCC, the answer is probably resection. So in conclusion, um, hepatocellular carcinoma is a growing problem. It will continue to be a problem for surgeons and uh, other medical professionals in the U.S. and around the world. Um, treatment is complicated by the non-malignant component of the liver disease, which makes this more challenging than treating other cancers. You can't always simply remove the lesion itself. Um, there are really few good palliative treatments. Um, patients that are not candidates for resection, their survival rate is not great with any treatment. Um, ablative therapies, specifically RFA, have results nearly equivalent to resection and transplant with small tumors. Um, and then resection and transplant are both viable options, but again, nothing is 100%. I'll take any questions. Well, that was an excellent, concise review of a very complex problem. Um, I just want to point out that the tumor biology uh, has an awful lot to do with the long-term results. In studies to try and determine uh, what the tumor biology is or one of the frontiers of treatment for this right now because um, in some ways being on the waiting list and having a certain drop-off rate is a selection criteria and it probably identifies patients who wouldn't do well even if they were treated immediately. And we see it as a bad thing but since we don't have a great treatment for patients with poor tumor biology it may be a good thing. And the one other thing is that there is no great chemotherapy right now, which is a huge limitation in the treatment for this disease. Yeah, in your early slides when you looked at cirrhosis and the prognosis over periods of years and the screening mm -hmm. and everything else, um, I, I, it's kind of off your topic, but I'm wondering if you came across anything 
as you read about cirrhosis and, and preparing for this, some people now are advocating being much more aggressive with operative porticable shunts for obviously non-tumor cirrhotics with GI bleeding and other complications. And I don't know if you came across anything that showed that impacted mortality because it, the, the handful of people that are going around the country giving presentations on, I did 100 last year and they're doing really well and all of us surgeons ought to do a lot more port cables are, are shunned <laughs> is probably not the word, but people aren't really adopting their practice very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I was curious if you found anything about that in the, in the cirrhotics. Um, I didn't really because I didn't do a lot of literature search on cirrhotics themselves um, and treatment for that, um, so I don't have a good answer for you. Yes, Kat, I enjoyed that very much. It was really good. In, in your reading, did you come across the uh, utilization of portal vein embolization specifically for a pedicellar carcinoma in patients that may be borderline resection candidates? Clearly, some have championed the effect of portal vein embolization, which is hypertrophy of, of the mm -hmm. residual liver, for metastectomy specifically in colorectal. Just wondering if there's anything in a paddle cellular. I didn't come across anything like that. Are you familiar with anything? Uh, yes, it is used um, if you have a marginal uh, situation in terms of the synthetic function of the residual liver, and it works fairly well. We don't use it a lot because we usually advocate transplantation rather than resection in marginal cases. We've had people at the VA that have gotten RFAs, and then we've had to keep them on our service for about two or three weeks while their liver kind of recovers and their ascites gets worse. And, and uh, so that's another side effect of one of your slides. By the way, so it was great talk.